asked me to talk, and I want to thank her for asking, and she originally asked me to talk about the um, Farmington Falls area. Uh, the, you know, there was a Jesuit mission there as well as the one in Norwich Walk. And I was like, well, you know, you should really get John Mosier at the state to talk about that because they just did that dig there. So that's good that John's going to talk, even though it's not really his topic. But I did get in touch with him and got a little update on what they found. But I thought, you know, talk about Norwich Walk, I decided to sort of start at the beginning um, just to sort of catch everybody up for people who may be unfamiliar with uh, Native American history. Um, and in talking about archaeology and in talking about ethno history, which combines historic documents and archaeology and um, different sort of modes of looking at the past. Um, you know, my perspective as an archaeologist, archaeology is one way to look at the past. Historic documents are another way to look at the past. Oral histories are another way to look at the past. Um, art is another way, oral history, artwork, pictures, whether it's on bark or in a museum as a painting. Um, for archaeology, the benefit of archaeology is we can look really far into the past. Um, you know, in the Americas, it's relatively recently been populated by people. Uh, and I just wanted to sort of start with, this is just a, you know, image grabbed off the internet. Like, where are all the oldest sites, or Paleo-Indian, which is not necessarily the oldest sites in the Americas, but what was thought to be the oldest. And there's a lot, basically. Um, People came into the Americas. It's a little bit debatable how they got here. They came, you know, from the Bering Land Bridge, originally the idea. But now it's thought, thought that there was probably a lot of ways people came along the Pacific coast, maybe a lot of colonization attempts, a lot unsuccessful, people coming down into the lower 48, maybe not surviving, some people surviving, making it all the way to South America. But in terms of Maine, uh, there's not that much debate about when people could have come here because Maine was covered in ice. Uh, so though we now are pushing back when people first came to the Americas, probably into like 20,000 years ago, maybe even earlier, we can't really push back when people came to Maine. Um, and these are just a few graphics. And this one here shows these ISO lines. And this one is 14.2. For, um, so about 14,000 years ago, the ice was starting to recede. And then by about 11,500, by 11,000, it's pretty much has receded north. But what happened, because of the weight of the ice, presses the earth down. When the gl glacial ice melted, the land was still compressed or suppressed. And so marine waters came right in over land. And this is like the limit of the marine, what it's called the marine invasion. Um, so in talking about when did people first come to Maine, this all sort of plays into it, uh, how and when people came. But pretty much when there was some dry land, people came. And there's a lot of Paleo-Indian sites known in Maine uh, they're very small, they're very hard to find. There's some people who think they're always on sand because it was dry. Um, there are some really well-known ones and well-studied. The, there's a lot of Paleo-Indian sites in Auburn, and Auburn is thought to be the location of almost like a congregation area where many people would go as, you know, maybe to you know, exchange goods, to get marriage partners. There's so many sites in Auburn that it's, and some big ones, that um, suggest that it was that type of situation. Um, any big blank doesn't really mean anything. Archaeology is like a needle in a haystack. And Paleo-Indian sites are small. Just think people who lived at this time, they were highly mobile. Uh, probably small family groups, um, small tool kits, given the necessity to sort of follow resources, whether it was animals or 
fish or other resources that were, you know, sort of just uh, being learned about as they moved into this sort of new territory. This is just a diorama that sort of is cool. It's a little hard to see, but it's just a little encampment overlooking a valley. And th this is where, you know, the idea of people who lived at this time um, may have hunted caribou. That's in Maine, that's probably what they were doing as, you know, one of the resources and other, other animals and uh, small, small mammals. The, it was, the, with, with sites that actually have pretty good preservation of animal bones, it's a pretty broad range. Um, the toolkit for the Paleo Indian people was what we know about was mostly stone, because that's what preserves in the archaeological record. Even though we can look back for thousands and millions of years for the human past in the world, it's really stone tools that last the longest. Um, if we were all to, you know, expire today, right here, right now, in a couple hundred years, um, we would be sort of piles of teeth that might survive, you know, my watch, my glasses, the metal, not much else, belt buckles. So the archaeological record is incomplete. Um, and also, the archaeological record, for the most part, is not like Pompeii in Italy, where Vesuvius exploded and the gas killed everyone literally like this. That is like amazing and incredible, but that is not what typical, a typical archaeological site is like. Most archaeological sites have been abandoned, and what's left was probably discarded. So the toolkit of these people, given their high mobility, was relatively small. These are all projectile or spearheads, um, just uh, you typically at a real high quality chert or flint, we call it chert in the United States, uh, scraping tools, there's a, sort of a host of other small cutting implements. Um, the Paleo-Indian period and this sort of adaptation of mobility and sort of moving around more uh, shifts in terms of how archaeologists look at it during what's called the Archaic period at about 9,000 years ago, you know, rivers were becoming more, you know, channelized. Um, so as one adaptation, um, people started living in different places. In Maine, typical archaic period sites along rivers, at river confluences, at lake outlets and lake inlets, anywhere where the fishing's good. Today, it might have been good, you know, 6,000 years ago. Some new artifact types that develop in the archaic period are groundstone tools like these gouges indicating a real uh, woodworking activity, a lot of activity around woodworking, net sinkers on the bottom or fishing weights, and then those top objects are um, probably sharpening tools for these gouges. There's a host of projectile point types during the archaic period, which last thousands of years. These are just some examples of um, late archaic points that date to about 4,000 years ago. Uh, yeah, these are from Medibemps, which is in Washington County, but you would, you could find these f here in the Kennebec River Valley. Um, and these are also from Medibemps. Some of the, some of the projectile points, the, this is a site, um, this is a, this particular point is from a site called the Taxiway, right in Auburn. We did work for the expansion of a new taxiway and found a new Paleo-Indian site. And we dug like a big area and there was one, we, co we covered one spear. And then a lot of little clusters of chips from stone tool making. And then um, this one is from another site near Auburn called La Montaigne that we also did, the, there was an industrial park that was being developed. And these are also all from Maine, just examples of um, the different, spearhead types. 
So the archaic period lasts a long time, and we're, you're basically looking at hunter-gatherers. They hunt different game animals. They collect plants. They eat nuts. They fish the rivers. Depending on where the site might be located, it could be alewife, it could be you know salmonid, you know trout or sa uh, or salmon, um, sturgeon, scoots have been found at archaeological sites, which are the, like the the plates on the fish. Uh, so it's very varied, and it's all about you know basically if it could be caught and eaten, it probably was. Could an archaeologist recover it from an archaeology site? Well, that's another thing. Um, so towards the end of the archaic period, around 3,000 years ago, people started making ceramics in Maine and the Northeast. Um, and life didn't change much. Pe the way people ate, the where they lived, it was very similar, hunting and gathering, um, a little bit more reliance on plant foods. Uh, but the first type of ceramic made in the Northeast, th this is the same, is it the same shard? No, it's two different shards. Um, was fabric paddled on both sides. And these pots would have been small, like this big, and um, pointed at the bottom. Hasn't been figured out why yet, but uh, maybe for how heat's transferred. And there's a host of different projector point types uh, during the woodland period. Uh, during the early woodland period, which lasts about a thousand years, people lived pretty much like they did during the archaic period, except for the ceramics. So small encampments, uh, hunting and fishing. Then during the middle woodland period, you have sort of an increase in, in some locations, multi-season settlements, you know, on the coast, in certain good fishing spots, and a big sort of fluorescence of pottery types and projectile point types. And the late woodland period in the Northeast at about 1000 AD, um, you see another big change, and that's really with the adoption of corn or maize horticulture. And the Kennebec River Valley in Maine is pretty much the, um, the eastern extent of pre-contact maize growers. Any further east, the the growing season just wasn't long enough. Um, so during the late woodland period in this area at Norridgewock on the Kennebec um, and other settlements on the Kennebec River right down to the coast, you would have had native peoples growing corn, storing corn, and also continuing with a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. But that adoption of corn changed other aspects of life. If you have to tend a garden, then you would most likely be living near that garden and staying there longer for longer periods of time. So the adoption of maize really changed how settlement, you know, changed how Native peoples lived and, and settled. Now in eastern Maine, it's a different story. Maize was never adopted until European contact. Um, so they, people, peoples who lived east of the Kennebec continued that hunter-gatherer lifestyle until into the 1600s when then different strains of corn could be grown in the shorter growing season. Do I say mine if I open a window? That'd be great. So now that we've covered like 12,000 years in a few minutes, hopefully, um, we'll start talking about what we would call the, in archaeologists call the contact period, when Europeans are first coming to um, the Americas, and in this case we're talking about the Northeast. Uh, it initially started with, and I'm not going to talk about the, um, the very early you know, settlements of the, uh, who am I, I, I just had my, what am I thinking of? The early settlements like in Red Bay, the. Avalon in, uh, up in Newfoundland. Yeah, yeah, I'm not talking about the early settlements, I'm talking about the 1500s and 1600s um, with the early fishing and fishing, fisheries in the Northeast. Um, 
this map is a little skewed, but you can see Cape Cod. And so this is a French map from 1680, and it just shows the importance of the Grand Banks in particular, where the cod fishery became a big economic uh, driver for European countries to come to the Americas. They came to fish, you know, for other reasons as well, but the cod fishery was a big economic driver. And initially, with the cod fishery, they stored them or they cured them on the boat in barrels of salt. And that's how they preserved the fish and they were brought back to France and Spain. And, but sometime in the 1600s, probably about the mid 1600s, they shifted to drying the cod on land and smoking it or just drying it. And that, that transition really brought more Europeans in contact with Native Americans. Um, this is a painting of Jack Cartier's landing on the St. Lawrence Iroquois, on the St. Lawrence River in 1535. And one of the reasons why I mention this is it, there's sort of a, a link between the St. Lawrence Iroquoians, who are an Iroquois-speaking uh, group that lived on the St. Lawrence and were visited in 1535. But then when Champlain came in the early 1600s, they were gone. And it's a current debate in archaeology. What happened to the St. Lawrence Iroquoians? Well, interestingly, in Norwich we have St. Lawrence Iroquoian pottery. And it's likely that some people from the St. Lawrence came as refugees to Norwich um, You know, here's another depiction, Champlain's depiction of the mouth of the Saco River in 1605, where it's a little hard to see, but you can see these are cornfields um, indicating that the people at the mouth of the Saco grew corn when they arrived. Uh, along with the, the cod fishery, with the transition to land-based curing of the fish, Europeans started seeing all these other resources. And one of the big ones was the beaver, uh, for, in particular, making the popular hats that were very popular in Europe at the time. So the fur trade, by the mid-1600s, Native Americans in this area would have been completely you know, involved in the beaver fur trade in particular. Uh, and so they would trap beaver, trade with Europeans, they would get items in, in exchange, including guns, uh, copper, blankets, food, um, Ooh, I'm going to skip that for a sec. Uh, items that they would trade for, for the beaver pelts, they started to use. And these items, in some cases, replaced their own traditional wares, like ceramics, Native American ceramic making stopped sometime in the late 1600s, probably, in the Kennebec River Valley. In you know, in favor of copper kettles and maybe even going back to wooden and bark containers. Um, guns were obviously became an important part of life for hunting and warfare. So you have this, for, from an archaeological standpoint, this is something that we can really look at, the material remains that are left behind. Um, and when you have this transition among Native peoples who had their own full and rich material culture completely change, you know, it's something that we can actually look at and measure. Um, one of the other most dramatic aspects of the contact period and Europeans coming to the Americas are the various pandemics that occurred. Some probably occurred in the 1500s. It's a little bit debatable when exactly they occurred in the Northeast, but by the early 1600s, smallpox and other viral diseases that Native Americans had no immunity to caused, in some cases, upwards of 90% mortality. 
So if you had a village of a thousand people and smallpox hit, you might be left with a hundred. And I mean, you can't, like we, now we're, we've been through a couple years of a pandemic and it's a little bit more um, understandable, I guess. I mean, one of the factors too, for people living in some of these village settings where you have a fairly dense population, um, when you have a virus, I mean, we've learned about this in the last two years, you know, go outside, open the windows, all that sort of thing. Well, that was a factor back in the 1600s too, when you have densely populated late woodland period villages and smallpox comes in and they're, you know, they're not crammed in, but I mean, they're pretty tightly, you know, living in a pretty densely uh, packed settlement that it has even more of a mortality um, rate. And then it, it's hard to imagine what, how that affected native life if, uh, if you have a thousand person community that is brought down to a hundred people and a lot of the elders may die and the people who have the knowledge on how to make things, how to fish in the right places, all those sorts of things. So when we talk about the contact period, it's very dramatic and in terms of like where, where people were when a lot of these population, um, loss of population resulted in shifts of people. You know, this group can't really survive on their own, so they'll go live with that family over there, or this group is gonna go up to the St. Lawrence and try to stay, live with a larger community, or the St. Lawrence Iroquoians, because of warfare, probably maybe disease, end up moving out of their home area because they can't survive there. So there's a lot of movements that are untrackable by archeologists. I mean, we can see it a little bit in ceramics, you know, in some cases, but when they stop making ceramics and, you know, written records aren't, aren't detailed enough, that it's, it's really difficult to know who's where, when, and um, that's one of the aspects of Native American lifestyles, just like us today, you know, we tend to take family in when needed, we group up when needed, we disperse when needed. Um, so along with probably the most dramatic effect of European contact being pandemics and loss of life, <clears throat> another you know, transition or transformative aspect was the um, conversion of native peoples to Christianity. And the Jesuits were you know, a main driver in this in the Northeast um, and that had a lot of uh, effects among native peoples as well. This is a, a, a map out of Colin Calloway's book, and it just sort of shows, um, you know, the Wabanaki, different tribes of the Wabanaki, and about where they were in the early 1600s, or the, the um, this is early 1700s. So the Wabanaki are all Algonquian speakers, and the Iroquois, like the Mohawk and the Five Nations, they're all Iroquois speakers. It's a different f language family. Um, and then the St. Lawrence Iroquois people were lived up here and even on to the northern shore of Lake Champlain. Because we've done work in Vermont and a lot of excavation at a big site in Swanton, Vermont, where there's sort of a, a there's like a, focus of St. Lawrence Iroquois community there. So this is sort of the layout roughly of Native American tribes, which look similar to today, except, you know, Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, you know, the Norridgewock aren't federally recognized, but there are Native peoples in the Kennebec River Valley today descended from um, the people who lived here back in the 1600s and the groups in New Hampshire and Vermont. Now, um, what we're talking about today, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get to, trying to go from like the big scale down to little scale is people at Norridgewock. And this is a, a depiction of an Abenaki couple 
Could have been from Norridgewock. I'm not sure where they were from. Could have been from anywhere, you know, in Maine or New Hampshire, possibly. Um, here's another map from 1680 that doesn't show much of Maine, but it, it just gets to the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, western part of Maine. You got to sort of tilt your head to try to figure it out. Lake Champlain. It's hard. Some of these old maps, it's hard to determine how to look at it. Um, one of the to get back to the Jesuit interest and in general the different European countries that were settling and had economic interests in uh, the Northeast. You obviously had the French that were centered on the St. Lawrence, the English centered in Massachusetts, but, you know, moving north, and that was one of their goals was to, you know, settle up the Kennebec River Valley, the Soccer River Valley, uh, and then, you know, the Dutch in Albany. But in Maine, the two big players were the French and the English. And the Abenaki were really sort of pinched between those geopolitics of the time that really had nothing to do with Maine and the land of the Abenaki or the Wabanaki, but was, you know, politics played out on a global scale. And one of the aspects of the French sort of strategy was to establish missions, you know, along all the major river valleys to protect Quebec from English coming from the south. So the Abenaki, you know, would, were probably most aligned with the French, but that's a real generalization. I mean, there were years of relative peace where the English at Kushnok, you know, in Augusta, would trade with natives on the Kennebec. So to say that, you know, the English and the Abenaki were always in conflict is wrong, but it, there, those, are the de those are the details that, you know, archaeology can't necessarily get at, nor even can history do it justice or written history do it justice necessarily. But in general, yeah, the Abenaki were aligned with the French and not the English. And with the King Philip's War, one of the first wars that would be like the Hundred Year War, there were a lot of different wars over that time, um, Maine, the area of Maine became a real you know, dangerous place. And so these Jesuit missions would be, you know, abandoned if there were times of war. And native peoples would go up to both St. Francis on the St. Lawrence and Bacancor, which are still actual um, native reserves today. So people from Wabanakis today who live in Maine have relatives on the St. Lawrence. Penobscot people have relatives from Norridgewock. Passamaquoddy people have ties to Norridgewock. So Norridgewock be, really is considered, a, you know, a sort of a central and important place for all the Wabanaki. Um, another map, now sort of to get a little more detail about Norridgewock, um, I mostly focused on the archaeology, and there were a couple other people that did research on the ethnohistory, really looking at a lot of historic documents to try to, you know, see what they could learn. And one of the things, Harold Prinz, um, who was an ethnohistorian who lived in Maine in the 80s, I guess, and has come back a bit, really super nice guy. Um, he's at University of Kansas. He found uh, he was interested in Nordrock, and he found a description that indicated, the description was from like 1647, and he, he found a description that indicated that the village was on the west side of the river. So this is a map from 1719, and you can't really read it, but that's showing Nordrock on the east side of the river, <clears throat> which is the Old Point Mission site that many of you have maybe have been to. This is the Sandy River coming in. I think that's what that's supposed to be. So Harold found a mention that there was a village on the west side. And so he and Bruce Bork at, from the Maine State Museum at the time went out to the west side of the river to see if they could find anything 
like a Native American site. And they, in fact, found what is now called the Tracy Farm site, where there's pre-contact and contact period um, settlement. There was a village there. So this is another map that's you know later or more recent, and it shows it's over here. You can always tell the big bend in the river, Nor Norridge Walk. So this is it's not really well marked, but that's Norridge Walk on that map. So Harold Prinz, you know, discovered that the village at Old Point wasn't the first village. It was there was one on the other side as well. So here's an aerial photo taken back in the 90s when we were working um, on sites, the, the Weston Dam in Skowhegan, at the time owned by CMP, uh, floods right up to Old Point. And you can sort of see, well, you can see here, those are like rips, you know. So from this point all the way to the dam in Skowhegan, it's basically a pond, you know, and they release water and the water goes up and down. Um, so for federal relicensing, because of the National Historic Preservation Act, uh, when it was built in the early 20s, I think, Weston Dam had never had any, you know, environmental review. So part of the work that we did was surveyed, you know, likely spots for Native American sites all the way from here, all the way down to the dam, and then evaluate them to determine which ones are eligible for the National Register. Um, this area of Norridge Walk, so Norridge Walk is here, Starks is here. You can't see it, but that's the Sandy River coming in there. Um, there's about, I don't know, I can't remember exactly, but I would say like 30 Native American sites between here and the Western Dam. And then right around this confluence area, which is like a crossroad, you know, crossroads or, you know, where fo there's a focus of activity. This is like a crossroad of Native American history. Um, you know, the Sandy River gets you over to Wilton and here, you know, Farmington. And um, so there's probably about six sites right within a kilometer of the confluence. And this big formation is called a point bar. So over about 10,000 years, the river, you know, is going around this big bend, has slowly boop, 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 deposited and dumped sand and cut, cut on this side and built out on that side. So it's a giant agricultural field. Um, the mission site is, this is the cemetery. For, for those of you who have been here, this is the cemetery. And the actual site is probably like right here. It's pretty small, really. But there's tons of archaeology all over that point bar. A lot of it is deeply buried. Are we looking north and south? We're looking probably south uh, east ish. Okay. So north is this. Right. right. So this is, this is Norridge Walk. Madison is like probably up here, you know, Starks on this side. So with, the, with, the, with Harold Prince's discovery, he went, as I said, and looked right over here. And they found a Native American site there. And at the time, it was owned by uh, the Tracy. I can't remember his first name. Um, the farmer who owned that, this whole property. And so it was named the Tracy Farm Site. So that site is in this field. Um, there was no survey done up in here. They, there could be older sites. And then the Sandy River site is right at the mouth of the Sandy. This would have been like a small hamlet. It would have been flooded every spring, so you couldn't live there year round. Whereas the Tracy Farm Site is high above the river, well above alluvial deposition, and so is an old point, the mission. So uh, before the establishment of the Jesuit mission at Old Point, there were what they called flying missions. Jesuits would travel around and visit different villages. And I think in 1650, um, 
Gabriel Duye visited at Tracy Farm a couple times, a Jesuit missionary, uh, maybe others, you know, over time. Uh, but then after King Philip's War and all the unrest and the French are getting nervous and they're establishing their mission sort of as a southern flank, I mean, this is one, you know, interpretation. There's, they probably wouldn't, Jesuits probably wouldn't explain it that way. Um, they want to establish a mission at, at Norridgewock because Norridgewock is one of the most, at the time, you know, long held stronghold of the Abenaki, still a little away from English settlement. The nearest one would be really, you know, um, in, in Winslow. Uh, so, but the Kennebec River at that time was considered the boundary between French Acadia to the east and New England to the west. So when the Jesuits said, let's put a permanent mission, they put it on the French side. That's why they moved. There was no other reason to move. You know, it was perfectly fine on the west side. They had room, it was up above the river, they had fresh water. So somehow they, the Jesuit, Sebastian Rail and others possibly talked the village into moving to the east side. Um, when, when they moved to the east side, it was described as a large, so this is probably in the 1690s, they established the mission on the east side of the river. It was described as a large fort, meeting house, and school that were erected the fort encompassed three quarters of an acre of ground built with palisados, wherein were 12 wigwams. Um, this drawing is actually by Harold Prince to reflect that description. <laughs> it's not like an, you know, uh, I just wanted to, I had another description. Um, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, the Tracy Farm was, de was described or mentioned probably as early as the 1620s as a village of 150 households, um, suggesting maybe 150 men with the math, you know, you could get up to six, seven, eight hundred people. Uh, that was a description from the probably the 1620s. So then you have the establishment of the permanent mission described as 12 wigwams with a palisade, you know, stockade. This is a modern drawing, not historic, and a church. Um, lots of different skirmishes between the English and the Abenaki, and the English realize that Sebastian Rail really is, you know, inciting the native peoples against the English. And so the English really, you know, after this settlement was first established in the late 1600s, 1690, they really try to attack the village a couple times. They try in 1703 and they, the people had, the native people had left and the English burned the village. Um, so the, when, the, as I said, when these different, you know, hostilities occur, a lot of native peoples in these communities would go up to the St. Lawrence. Odenac is one of the Indian reserves that still exists today that they would go to. This is at St. Francis. Um, ultimately, uh, what, they rebuilt the village. The village was burned like in 1703, rebuilt in 1711, and when it was rebuilt, the description says, Built, this is a historic description, built with round logs nine foot long and set into ye ground is 160 foot square with four gates but no bastions. Within are 26 houses built much after the English manor. That's sort of important. So, you know, Sebastian Rail lives with this community. They you know, they're involved with different hostilities with the English settlements, you know, on and off again. Um, there's, they leave the village if they have to, 
Finally, in 1724, the English attack for really the third time that's recorded in 1724, and they catch the villagers unaware. They kill Sebastian Rail and probably dozens of native people. Um, this is an actual woodcut from a Boston newspaper showing the, you know, the, the attack. Um, Does it say where the English came from? You know, it's known, it is known. I, I can't remember exactly where they came from. I mean, they came up to Kennebec. They might have been coming from, you know, Augusta. I'm not sure. It is known. It's just not remembered by me right now. <laughs> um, so, you know, the English came with Mohawk warriors, apparently, and, um, and, oh yeah, oh yeah. What? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's pretty well documented. So, the, obviously, the village was, you know, abandoned again, and people ran into the woods and probably went north, went wherever, and it was re, it was reoccupied um, after the Treaty of Dummer in 1726, off and on up until the 1750s, when Fort Western was built in Augusta um, and Fort Halifax in Winslow in the 1750s, that might have just been like too close for comfort, and the village was, I think, sort of pretty much finally abandoned by then. When Benedict Arnold goes through on his trip to Quebec, there's nobody at Norridgewock. So now I'm going to talk about the archaeology. That was my little history rendition, and now I'm just going to quickly show you some pictures of what, does the ar what do the archaeology sites actually look like, and how do they compare between each other. I'm just going to start with Sandy River site. This is, like I said, probably where people lived you know, maybe in the summer, fall, when it wasn't flooded. And this is a deeply stratified site where the bottom of the plow zone is actually here. That's like that deep. So they'd plow, you know, starting in the probably late 1700s, it would flood, and then they'd plow, it would flood. And we're talking big flood deposits. But the, these are, are little, you can see, little thin flood deposits. This is a feature with a hearth that has corn in it. I think this dates to like 1650. At that site, we have both St. Lawrence Iroquoian ceramic vessel right here. That was actually made by probably a woman, probably um, you know, a St. Lawrence Iroquoian woman. And this is an Algonquian pot dating to about the same age. This is, these date to about 1450 AD. So the site has a couple, com many components, and you can see with the amount of deposition, you know, that's occurring, um, it's, this is a really important site. Tough, you know, digging deep, tough, hard to, real thin, thin, thin layers. Um, but the preservation is really incredible. Um, Tracy Farm, you know, in the picture on the right, the Sandy River is just out of view down here. Tracy Farm is up high. It's what we would call a non-depositional site. There's no agent of deposition. It's a landform that was established probably, you know, 15,000 years ago and really hasn't changed since, other than being cut by the river. Um, so at this location, you know, once we sort of understood the site, we could take the plow zone off, and there was really good visibility of cultural features underneath the plow zone. And so we would find storage pits and hearths, and this is just pictures of people mapping different features. Um, Native Americans in the late woodland period at about AD 1000 started storing food in subterranean holes in the ground, and uh, both for you know effective food storage, but possibly also for concealment. Um, you know, your food stores were hidden. No one could find them. Maybe you knew where they were. And if you had to abandon the site, they maybe wouldn't be found. That's an idea. It, um, many of the storage pits, so in this picture, I know it's a little hard to see. Half of the feature is gone. This was around like this, this deep, but then you add the plow zone that had 
plow zone has scooped the top off, right? Um, it was probably about this deep. So we've taken half out and left half behind. And you can see this is bark. This was a bark line pit. And in some of the pits, we actually have sewn bark on like a ring, almost like a barrel of a bark container lined these pits as a way to you know, keep rodents and other varmint out. We had a couple UMF field schools here. Um, that's the chaos that you see. You know, everyone's digging and <clears throat> having fun. Um, this, some of this work was part of the relicensing for CMP of the Western Dam because the, you know, the river bank was eroding down below. So at Tracy Farm, we ended up doing, I can't remember exactly, but I'd say a couple hundred square meters of hand excavation in this area. And then all these other things were mechanical stripping off that plow zone to look for features. And in this area, this big area that we opened up, we found the remains of a longhouse. Um, oh, that's just more of those features. Um, so over here on this picture, you can see this is what we were finding, these little dots. They're about as big as a tennis ball uh, in the, the sediment, which was like an olivey yellow color. So everything showed up very easily. Um, and this was what, what I'm focusing on here is a double wall, which were, was typical on the north side of some of these longhouses. These are typically a uh, structure found among Iroquois speakers. Um, so in, this is like the full longhouse. It was about 25 meters long. And this big blob here is a, is a big middle woodland feature that predates the longhouse. Um, but the, the sticks mark where the posts were. Sometimes, you know, there's, it's a little bit of confusion, but ba basically what we have here is a structure. Was it used for residences? Was it like a communal building? We didn't find any other houses. We might have found like a little wigwammy type thing. Um, but it is one of the first, first longhouse found in Maine, so it's, it is unusual. Um, it's just not known were there others there. Could have been. Mapping, so we don't know. You did look something like this, you know, a bunch of how, long houses like this. These are multifamily. In Iroquois, um, these are matrilineal in that the female line of the family is sort of the leaders of the house. And so we, in the houses, it's related females. So um, I live with my brother. My husband comes to my house. Uh, my brothers live with me. My husband's family lives somewhere else. What, what the situation was at Norridgewalk, it's hard to say. but. This is, I don't even know what, what this is from. It's just a sort of a cool depiction of a bunch of longhouses. This was how they often looked, sort of willy-nilly, you know, not necessarily all lined in a row, just sort of like, you know, putting the house up. These might have been used for generations, rebuilt, burned down. Um, so we're, we're not sure at Norridgewalk whether, you know, we have that early description, 150 households. You know, in one of these long houses, you could have had, you know, these are little smoke holes, one, two, three, four, five, six. Often a family shared a hearth. So that might have been six families in this, in this one long house. That's sort of the size that I think we found, maybe not quite six, maybe four or something. So it's a little hard to know exactly what the significance of the long house is. This is another artist depiction, not of Tracy Farm, but I sort of like it for Tracy Farm, what it might have looked like. Um, different size houses, possibly. So here's some more example of the storage pits. People dug these pits for storage, and then they, I sort of think they might have gotten infested with um, animals or rodents, and then they used them for trash. Because what we're looking at is trash. And this is like, this is an example in archaeology where we're right, we're right down maybe to a season, you know, not a day, not a person, but a, maybe a season of time. And so they would fill it with trash, and these are just all different like dumping episodes, really full of 
detail, archaeological detail, subsistence remains, fragments of artifacts. These are just some examples of the different shapes of the storage pits. So now we're switching over to the mission site. So this is a location where, based on archaeology, nobody lived here. They lived here at about 4,000 years ago at the mission site. We have evidence of late archaic occupation, but then nothing, not a piece of ceramic, which would be, was what we would find, um, until the mission is established. And unlike the longhouse, where you have those individual posts, like big alders put in the ground, the, what we found at the Old Point Mission might have been that second iteration of the village that said it was built after the European manner. Because these are trench foundations, very different than how a native would make a house. So in the trench, they would put posts. So we found the remnants of a couple structures, and we found sections of the palisade. This is what the palisade looked like, a big black blob, linear blob. And it was not that deep. It was sort of this, well, where we cut into it, maybe this deep sort of basin shaped. Sometimes you'd find a post mold, like where there was a post, and now it's gone. Um, these did less excavation at the mission site. You know, it's wooded. Um, it was all volunteer. There wasn't any, as I recall, there wasn't any relicensing funds. So it was, uh, there's been a lot of looting at the mission site over the last, you know, 150 years or so, less so recently. Um, but this shows some of the features that we found. This is the palisade, storage pits, just like at Tracy Farm, the storage pits. So. In the absence of um, some of these traditional feature types, like the storage pit, we, you wouldn't have known it was a Native American site because there were no Native American artifacts. Um, so here's a couple of the structures we found. Here's the section of the palisade that we, we tried to follow it. You know, So I think that this palisade maybe belonged to the first iteration of the village and those structures were part of the second part of the village. Um, all three sites, the Tracy Farm, the Old Point Mission, and Sandy River are now listed with the federal government as a National Historic Landmark. That's like a step up from the National Register of Historic Places. Um, back in the 90s, the Maine State Museum and you know us at UMF got together and nominated and they, Bruce Bork sort of did most of the legwork for it, but based on the archaeological work and the importance to the Abenaki and Wabanaki tribes. Um, and so the Tracy Farm and the Sandy River are still held in private ownership, but there's a conservation easement that there can't be development. And the Old Point Mission is owned by the Archaeological Conservancy. Um, Looking, one of the things I did about my dissertation, you know, I have to look at some issues and problems, like how did things change between Norridge Walk 1 or Tracy Farm and Norridge Walk 2 at Old Point? And in terms of subsistence, it looked very much the same. They grew corn, they fished, they hunted, the same kinds of, you know, animals. These are salmonid vertebra from the different storage pits, both burned or calcined and unburned, you know, it's not that old, so unburned bone survives. And then here's a real distinctive element of the catfish, the dorsal fin, which we find a lot of catfish in archaeology because this little element is easy to find in all the burned up bones. Um, just looking quick at like comparison of the faunal remains, the bones between the two sites, it's pretty much the same. Suggest and, and then floral remains, domesticated plants, maize, squash, beans, nuts, economic weeds, medicinal grasses and fleshy fruits like blueberries and blackberries. Um, it's very similar. What isn't similar is the material culture. Where we have ceramics at Tracy Farm and Sandy River, these are more examples of St. Lawrence Iroquois, but there's also Algonquin um, pots. And stone arrowheads, these are typical triangular shaped late woodland arrowheads. 
At Old Point, there is no Native, traditional Native American artifacts. There's copper points and lead shot and gun flints and cut up copper. So they would get copper and they would use, use the kettle maybe to cook with, but they would also cut it up and cold work. Native people's cold work copper. There's copper reserves in areas of the Great Lakes. And so copper working is a, is a um, long held you know, uh, tradition among Native peoples. So they would cut up copper and make different things, smoke kale and smoking pipes. Some of you may have found some of these at different historic sites. One of the interesting things in some cases, like the copper, the cold working of the copper, Native people used European you know, resource in a traditional way. This is a wine bottle, and that upper edge is worked into a scraping tool. So that's where we see sort of the native, you know, a, you know continuation of practices that were long held. Uh, copper beads and tinkling cones, these little things that they would sew on their clothes. Um, pendant, copper pendant, my little pencil, I can't find it. And then these are European beads. These are all made in Europe, collected from, you know, mostly from the storage pits because we would do fine screening. Otherwise, you would never find these things. These are tiny little seed beads that would be used for embroidery and then larger like necklace beads. All these are, this is a piece of catlinite, which is a stone from Minnesota right here. So that's one actual bead that isn't European made. Um, we found some Jesuit rings, which was one of those trade items that they would give to um, to native peoples, a thimble. So some of those little, really personal item, uh, a mouth harp. And then, like, here's a, a wine bottle. This is broken, but it was one of those, you know, it's probably like this big, one of those uh, pushed up bottoms. This was in a little pit. I always think it was like Sebastian Real's little wine stash, that he had it in a hole, because it was in a hole. Um, so, you know, here's a depiction of Native peoples with the kale and pipe and, you know, making baskets. You know, as I said, today, it's, this is a National Historic Landmark. The Wabanaki as a whole hold this site as very ceremonial because of the loss of life and the, you know, sort of the, the struggles that went on here at Norridgewock. There's some newer um, monuments that, you know, I don't have shown here today. Um, though Native peoples may have left the Norridgewock area, you know, at Old Point and Tracy Farm, they didn't disappear. They just sort of literally like went under the radar, as they did in many parts of the Americas in the 1800s when being Native was, you know, you, was sort of a dangerous thing maybe to admit. Um, but right locally, you know, we know about the Pierre Pole who lived in Farmington, lived in Strong, um, had quite a big family. Uh, so the, you know, the enduring story of Norridgewock isn't over. It's just, you know, and I don't know, personally, I don't know any Native peoples who, other than I know Passamaquoddy people and Penobscot people, who have ancestral ties to Norridgewock. I'm sure in the Kennebec River Valley, there are people who also do. They're just unknown to me. Um, but Norridgewock, you know, being close here to Farmington, and I didn't talk much about Amasconti, the, the other Jesuit mission location in Farmington Falls, but that was probably not as big or maybe long duration as the Norridgewock settlement. But there's a lot still to be learned about Norridgewock, and luckily it's protected, you know, to the extent that we can protect archaeological sites for, uh, you know, possible future work or even all the material that was excavated from the sites and from all the sites on that project are at the Maine State Museum, um, so available for future study as well. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer any. Yeah. How do you know where to look in the first place? 
Well, like when you go camping, you pick a dry spot next to the river. That's what archaeologists do. We go to confluences. We go to lake outlets. You know, we don't like to dig in poison ivy, but poison ivy is actually a, what we call a camp follower. So poison ivy sometimes is where the archaeology site is. <laughs> um, so yeah, you look at places that are look habitable, you know. The hard parts are finding really, really old sites, like the Paleo-Indian sites. Even though in Maine there's an idea that they're always on sandy sediment, but that's not always true. But you basically look where it could be habitable. And, and you don't, you know, you can't find everything and digging is hard and recovery is patchy and... There was more that went on in Norwich Walk then than there is now. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you, you ride through it as quickly as you can. I know. It's a, it, it's a really a nice spot though. Like, and you can really, now the, you know, there's the pines up here that is um, sort of like a park. I think it was owned by the paper company. I think the town now owns it. But it is a beautiful spot. It's really a pretty stretch of river. Yeah. Um, you were saying that when the pots started being formed, like, were they mostly used and made below the marine limit? where there was presumptive formation. The, 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 the ceramics? ceramics? Yeah, because it's, you know, that clay, I mean, you yeah. see even it. Right. right. Well, well, you know, you, you find can... pottery up in the county, so, you know, it's not just where you could get that presumptive formation. And there haven't been a lot of um, studies. There's been some to determine, like, clay sourcing, mm. but it's very tough, you know, and not many people do it. Like, I know, uh, an archaeologist from Quebec studied Norwich ceramics because of the St. Lawrence connection and compared it to St. Lawrence ceramics and it didn't match anything. It didn't match any main stuff or St. Lawrence stuff. It was a little bit of a curious. But native peoples in Maine made ceramics all over the place. So even though in eastern Maine, for example, they didn't adopt corn growing, they were making ceramics. But you know, early, during the early woodland, when they first started making pots, I mean, they, it wasn't like a family made a bunch of pots. They probably had one pot. Mm. And it might have been used, it's hard to know, like, did they cook everything in it? Did they make special medicinal things in it? It wasn't really until the late woodland, or in the latter part of the middle woodland, like, say, 600 AD, that you had more and more pots, and maybe a family had a couple pots and different sized pots, but there was no glazing in the Northeast. Just, there were just these conical shapes, and then they got bigger in the late woodland period. It would be really easy to make pots in that area. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I there, mean there were, you know, we find manufacturer scraps, which are just little pieces of clay that got cooked but didn't get made into anything. But we didn't do any tests to try to determine where was this clay from. Did you run into it a lot when you were reading? No. Really? No, because it's deeper than, at least for Norwich Walk, I mean, I'm trying to think, you know, of like in Vermont, we run into clay what, like constantly in parts of Vermont and Native Americans dug pits into it, literally like we're like cursing them trying to screen it. But in Maine, I don't know, can you think of Steve when you hit digging in archaeology that you'd hit the presumpscot formation? I mean, you see it in no, I know, but that's really pretty, like if you think it's pretty deep. Yeah. Like I can't even think of ever hitting it. We did, we like a, like, uh, this much, uh, nothing here. <laughs> but in Vermont, you know, a, the similar situation around Lake Champlain in southern, you know, in the like Middlebury area, it is so much lake, you know, lake. lake clay that Native Americans dug holes into. So did you have streams set up on top of Oh yeah, oh that's what, oh yeah, oh yeah. So you have all that alluvium on top of it. And so we would have, I can't even think of hitting it 
I see, I've seen it. I know exactly what you mean. On Sandy, there's stretches and you, can, you can't even get out of a canoe because right. it's so wet and slippery. slippery. So. In the Sandy River Valley? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not the, Maine isn't as early as Vermont, you know, like we have a lot of dates in Vermont for maize at a thousand, basically a thousand AD. It's in, you know, Pennsylvania, eight, nine hundred AD. Um, Maine, you know, I think the earliest date on Maine for maize might be down on the Saco at what a site called Little Ospy North at about 1200 AD. Like we haven't quite gotten back as early. Um, I, think, I think it exists, but it's just a matter of like we just haven't, you know, dated the right piece maybe. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Because you said you also worked in New Hampshire. Yeah, more, more in Vermont. Right. I haven't done a huge amount in New Hampshire. Nothing that we could, uh, surveys and stuff, but not a lot of any kind, like this kind of scope. More so in Vermont. All right, what am I doing here? I'm going because home. I read of early 1600s in the Winnipesaukee area where the native people were <laughs> above the floodplain, letting those early settlers <laughs> wash <laughs> out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, sure, they, they, they thought they had the great place. Yeah. And they described in. Um, encountering huge, fairly good sized groups of families. And oh, yeah. well, well, like on the Connecticut River, River, on the Connecticut River, there were some big settlements like uh, Fort Hill. Would be close yeah, Winnipesaukee. Yeah, right. Okay. Here's, a, uh, here's a Merrimack. So they would go back and forth up to Old Town. So where would Old Town be on that map? Well, Old Town, so the Penobscot, this is the Penobscot. And, oh, I don't know, maybe up in there somewhere. Maybe there, roughly. And didn't the Norwich go down and participate in some really aggressive stuff around York and oh, yeah. Dover? And, oh, yeah. Yeah. And Oyster River. Right. Okay. And that was at the urging of the French. Right. <laughs> so I, just as an aside, one of the last big projects that I did with my company was for the Vermont Department of Transportation up in Swanton, Vermont, which is this is, um, I think this is supposed to be the Missisquoi River. It doesn't, I think, yeah, this is the Missisquoi. So right along, it was called Route 78. It's sort of like a Route 2, you know, that kind of um, size road and busyness, big sort of east-west from Vermont into over into Alberg. And, you know, it, the DOT wanted to widen the road for like, the project it was like 25 years old, maybe 30 now, so on. Like 1990, 1995, UMF did the first survey for that project. But anyway, we finally did big data recovery there in 2013 up here, you know, sort of northern Lake Champlain, but right in Vermont, and found a longhouse, just very similar to the one at Tracy Farm. Um, but at this settlement, though, there is a lot of ceramics from St. Lawrence, Iroquois, some, but more so from southern Quebec that, you know, from like 1200 AD, there's a mix. There's Algonquin pots and there's pots from southern Quebec. It's really sort of incredible. But um, 
I don't know, I said a little aside. I, the, you know, the idea of the longhouse, that's another one sort of a, on the small side. In Iroquois, among like the Mohawk and the Huron, they would get as big as um, football fields. Huge. That was like 1300 AD. That was sort of like the pinnacle, 13, 1400 AD, when they would get really big like that. Just run? Like the, well, the Wabanaki, the yeah, Wabanaki is all that, you know. So, oh, like, was this like language translation? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I, like, I've read that they sort of think Norwich was a little bit of a dialect. That's why they were called the Kennebec, you know, as opposed to, you know, just Abenaki. But I'm, I don't really know that much about the languages. This is where the contact period really mushed everything up. And that, you know, other than, you know, the Passamaquoddy and the Penobscot, you know, and, and then, I mean, it's just hard to know where everyone really was, who's who, how far back does that go? Like, people will often ask me, you know, say for a 3,000 year old site, what tribe was it? And I'm like, mm, I don't, you know, I don't know. It's in the, it's in Penobscot territory, so it's the ancestors of the Penobscot. But other than that, you can't really say much. Well, thanks for being so attentive. <laughs> <laughs>